It beats about 70 times a minute, pumps about one third cup each time or 2,000 gallons every day. Cardiology issues tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. The heart and cardiovascular system are favorite subjects for us here at On Call. We will beat that drum again tonight. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Fill in the blank. In 1628, who was the doctor who first described the circulation of blood pushed by the right heart pump through the lungs, back to the left heart, out to the body, and then back again through the veins? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays, originally written for this show, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your medical questions, though, about heart issues all night long as they're called in or sent to us via Facebook, or email. Call in the questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. And I should say one thing about my new haircut. I have appreciated through this uh, whole experience with pancreatic cancer your support and your words and I've gotten a lot of feedback and it's been rewarding. I um, had chemotherapy a year and a half ago. I didn't lose much hair that time new chemotherapy this uh, round and hair's falling out might as well cut this stuff off actually the real reason that i did that is because i wanted to have the same haircut mike hibbard our guest tonight is uh, has dr mike hibbard fellow of the american college of cardiology with north central heart a division of avera heart hospital one of our favorite guests thank you for joining us mike thanks for having me rick so uh you're a cardiologist but you know that's your first name. Your last name is General Internal Medicine Doctor. I mean, you were an internist first, right? Right, right. So I would, has that carried through in your experience as a cardiologist? Well, the thing is, is when I, I uh, got to medical school, the, the thing that fascinated me is that there were so many different things that could happen with the heart. So I did internal medicine. And, and when I was a kid, my dad taught me to learn everything about everything. So I was fascinated with everything. And he's a, just he hard was a rancher a farmer, right? He actually uh, did a lot. He was a jack of all trades, actually, which is part of the reason he said learn about everything yeah. about everything. Yeah. Because in those days, you never knew if your job was going to be there or not be there. So you had to be ready to do the next thing if that job, you Does know, it, petered out. Work. Yeah, it didn't work out. So. Uh, the deal is, is I was fascinated by everything, but the the bus stopped at the at the cardiac. Uh, and that's where the fellowship. bus stopped. <laughs> yep, <laughs> dropped me off, and I've been there ever since. So uh, you trained at the Mayo, right, for right, cardiology? Right. That was that your internal medicine residency? Actually, I started at Mayo Clinic in research way back when, and then I left and went to the University of Minnesota for seven years, and then I came back to Rochester for four years before I moved to South Dakota. Right. So you've been practicing since 1981 here. Right. Well, not, not here in uh, between the University of Minnesota and, and um, Mayo Clinic, and then 25 years in South Dakota. 25 years here. Yeah. So uh, you have a lot of interests, uh, but it's interesting, as you were discussing our pre-professional group, uh, I, I learned something I didn't quite realize that I knew, that um, you have an interest in congenital heart disease. I know I've sent you some congenital cases, and you handled them beautifully. I mean, that's part of it. But um, tell me a little bit about what congenital heart disease is. Well, in the old days, if you had congenital heart disease, and what we're talking about here is where some of the chambers of the heart aren't connected the way they're supposed to be. Yeah. You know, I can recognize you. You have two arms and two eyes, and they're generally in the same place that right. mine are and that the people here helping with the show are. But with congenital heart disease, you can't assume that everything is where it's supposed to be. Some people, the heart normally has four chambers. Some people only have one uh, on the bottom part of the heart or two chambers, and the blood is all mixing, and it doesn't uh, uh, work very well. People born blue is your shirt there, right. and they have to have surgery uh, immediately in childhood. And sometimes not now you can have those complex operations even on little babies, but those people now that used to die 
before they reach the reproductive years are living into adulthood. And some of those congenital heart defects are hereditary. And as we get clever, more clever, and, and uh, develop new procedures for dealing with these problems, um, that people are living way into advanced stage. Living a, a normal life. A so normal speak. life. But the problem is, is that used to be the purview of pediatric people right. to take care of these people until they passed. But now the pediatricians Before they died. Before they died, yeah, before they passed away. So now they're living old enough to have their own children, and then they develop not only the congenital problems that they have, but they develop unique problems superimposed on the ones that everybody gets, high blood pressure, cholesterol, heart attacks, and then you really have to have your, your thinking, thinking hat. cap on and Yeah, one. because nothing's connected like it's supposed to be and the usual paradigms don't work, and so you a lot of times have to customize the treatment, and many people don't know what to do with those people. Right, but let's just take a typical congenital heart disease problem and tell me, uh, uh, first of all, how many of those are not able to be saved? There's a number of those kids that just you can't help them. The deal is is that the, the ones that can't be saved usually die in utero. And they're even, a lot of people don't know that they can diagnose some of these diseases while the, the baby is still in the womb. With ultrasound. With ultrasound. And then they can do what they call transcutaneous uh, fetal heart surgery with scopes through the abdomen, through the belly, the, the mother's belly, and through the uterus into the baby and, to, and correct some of these uh, issues before they're, they're even, even born. born. Wow. So to, just to give you an idea how uh, advanced things have become. Wow. But you don't do most, mostly you, d you don't deal with congenital heart disease. Most of your day is spent with what, coronary disease and heart failure? Yeah, coronary disease, heart failure, the, uh, basically the gamut of, of heart disease. Um, people have a rhythm, you know, I tell people that their, their heart is like their car. You have to have an electrical system, you have to have the fuel lines that bring the, the blood, you know, to service the heart, and then you have to have the block and the crankcase and the pistons and stuff, which is basically this, I don't know, I think this comes apart here. It does, pull it on the bottom. There, there we go. go. So this, I would say, is the block and the crankcase. You have the heart chambers and the heart valves, the, the pipes, and so this is the, like the furnace of the um, body and so you can have problems with any one of those. And what I tell people is you could have a brand new Detroit diesel V8 and the electrical system doesn't work, you're hitchhiking. Yeah. <laughs> and so the deal is, is it all has to work somewhat well for you to be able to get to church on time. Yeah, there it is. Yep. Uh, we have a question. What happens when the heart beats at less than 50% of ejection fraction? I mean, I'll explain that. And, and what are the potential problems with that? So, Tell us about heart failure and the strength of the squeeze and what happens when the squeeze gets weaker. Well, the, as you said at the outset, as the heart pumps 2,000 gallons of blood a day through 60,000 miles of pipe between the soles of your shoes and your haircut. And it does it for up to 122 years with no mistakes. And so the deal is, is there's many ways that that engine can have problems. And we don't take very good care of it, you know. They do, I tell people that when you're born, the Lord gives you a box of tools, your arms, your legs, your liver, your kidneys. And um, when your heart function doesn't pump, it doesn't meet the body's needs, and everything of the body depends on that. Now, if your heart function is only half of normal, you can still get by um, as long as you are not obese. Um, I tell people that your heart is about the size of your fist, so you can see that this heart here I'll just put this back together, is my fist is a little bit bigger. And if you put your hand up, Rick, you can see that I have a V8 and, and you I have, have a six-cylinder six. EcoBoost. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just do that. And you see people who are carrying this tremendous weight, this weight problem that we have in this country, and you look at, you can imagine the size of their fist, and that's all the bigger the, the engine is that scoops your snow, uh, sweeps your steps, vacuums your rugs, carries your groceries, pots the flowers. That's all the bigger the furnace is and it has to last 100 years. Now when it squeezes, up 55% of it will eject and it won't push completely. It won't be completely empty, but a normal squeeze is like about 55%? 
Yeah, 55 to 65 percent. So there's always, it, it, your heart doesn't squeeze flat like a pancake because then it would be 100 percent. So there's always about 30 or 35 percent of the blood left in there. Now the, the deal is your heart just doesn't squeeze like a ball. It's very complicated. It twists, it shortens, and it compresses all at the same time. And so I tell people that if the only thing you had to do to stay alive was to hit a tennis ball off the wall 100,000 times a day, do you think you would get tennis elbow, <laughs> arthritis, rheumatism? <laughs> yeah. And so when you think about what the heart has to do, even with half capacity, and there's, you'd be surprised or astonished how many people are living in this country with congestive heart failure. It's, a, it's an epidemic. So uh, congestive heart failure, I'd, I'd rather say weakened heart, means that that ejection fraction that's normally 55 to 65 percent is in the what range? And how low can it go before a person dies? Well, there's two parts to the heart function that a lot of people forget about. Everybody understands the squeezing part, you know, right. like you're talking about the weakened that's heart. That's the systole. That's the systole. That can be completely normal and you can still have severe heart failure right. because the heart has to go back. So when you think about the blood pressure ball that they check your blood pressure with, right. when you squeeze that, the heart actually sucks the blood in for the next beat. Right. And when you're young, your heart is like filet mignon. When you get to be my age, the heart has started to stiffen up because of that constant pumping. And so you get more like pound steak. You save a couple yeah. of bucks, but you have to chew and chew and chew. Yeah. And so the heart gets stiff. I've never heard the pound steak story, but that's good. <laughs> so we were into filet, into pound steak, and then when you're 90, it is... You can imagine how tough it is. Yeah. You know, you're just like a tough old bird, like you say the common lingo, and your heart has gotten tough too. So if it doesn't want to suck the blood in, then the top chamber wants to, this chamber up here, the atrium, tries to jam the blood in, but it doesn't want to go, so these chambers enlarged. And then what happens is the electrical connections that are like this get stretched out, and then you come down with atrial fib. Or which, electrical problems. Electrical problems. Rhythm problems. Yeah, and then that's those uh, commercials they have on every Sunday night. They want you to buy these medicines to thin your blood so you don't have a stroke. Right. So heart failure, heart pump, is an amazing uh, problem, an interesting problem. What do we do for it? And has there been any advances? Well, I tell people there's only four things that I can do. I have all these years of training, all this experience. Yeah. One, I can do nothing. If you're looking for somebody to do nothing, I'm the guy to hire ah. because I will get the gold medal for that. <laughs> but the thing is, is that won't do you any good, and that's for a person that's 95 years old with cancer at the nursing home. Two is I can try to figure out how to get you to be healthy in the first place. Eat like your life depends on it. Exercise like that. Get to your ideal body weight like high school. If you just do those three things, you reduce your cardiac risk 80%. There's nothing that I do with surgery and pills from the drugstore that give you that benefit. No. That can even compete with that. Lifestyle is the Key. way to go. Did you hear that? That, and I think you know, if you can, you can walk a mile a day, or you can walk 30 minutes a day. You really get almost the best benefit of the exercise you could possibly get. So my goal has always been to. to encourage people to do that. Well, you see, we don't do anything in, in this country anymore. You know these Fitbit watches that yeah. everybody is going around with that says 10,000 steps a day, you really cutting it up. Yeah. But the thing is, is that some of the healthiest people in the world are the Amish. And do you know that they put Fitbit watches on the Amish people and do you know that they had 19,000 steps yeah. a day? Because <laughs> they do everything the old way. Yeah. You know, that you have to do things by hand and all these accoutrements that we have the remote control, the garage door opener, the riding lawnmower. Uh, you know, the average person walks into the store to buy groceries, that's about it, or just blows the snow off the driveway. I, I am, I think if we could get people to be doing that, if they don't need to, to do the walking, do the walking anyway. If you don't have to go get water, okay, but do the walking any, anyway. In our busy lives, it's easy to miss the warning signs of cardiovascular problems. When they're recognized, immediate treatment and some lifestyle changes are needed. I was a very stressed out, overworked salesman and I came down with a huge pain in my leg. You know, I was traveling home and I ignored it and I think it came down on a Thursday and I lived the weekend on the couch moaning and groaning and popping ibuprofen 
And uh, finally had my sons take me out to the clinic to see Dr. Rick Holm on Monday morning. He could tell exactly what it was because of the numbness and the whiteness and the coldness of the leg. And Dr. Holm told me in about five minutes in his uh, office uh, that he needed to get me to the heart clinic in Sioux Falls immediately. And what they did was break up the clot, but then they took a piece, and I'll, I'll say vein, although I don't know if that's the correct term, and they borrowed one from up here on the leg, and they put it in down here on the leg, which evidently was a remarkable feat of surgery. I know, I certainly felt a lot better. I was a smoker, am a smoker. Uh, no, I did not have problems with uh, cholesterol. I had See, at that time I had had two heart attacks that I had angioplasty done for down at the Heart Institute. Uh, not a very good diet, uh, about 60 pounds heavier than I am today. Very, very little attempt to exercise other than uh, walking through airport concourses. I'm a diabetic also. Because of all of the good things, including the weight loss, um, my medications have dropped drastically. I still take insulin, um, but the number of prescription drugs have gone from about 12 or 13 a day down to three plus the insulin now. Life in general, watch the diet. It, uh, it doesn't get easier to uh, lose weight and become healthful or semi-healthful as you get older. Thank you, Mike. Um, I would I'd like to have you realize that this is your show. Your questions are key to our show discussion. We love your questions, or even your comments. Give us a call, really, please call us at 1-888-376-6225, or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. Please, your show, give us a call. We were talking about the, the treatment of heart failure, and that's one of the more difficult uh, challenges. You said that the heart squeezes, and that's important, but it also has to relax, and we lose that relaxation as we turn into you know, a, a, um, a tougher steak as we get older. That's what's... <laughs> so are we doing anything more that we can do for a person who has a, an ejection fraction in the, what, 10% range? Yes. Uh, the people that have severe heart failure, uh, the best thing you can do is, like the gentleman said during the break, is to get down to your ideal body weight because then you're not expecting that weakened heart to do all that extra work carrying the right. extra weight. If you can't make it with that and the pills are failing, we do have a variety of devices now that we can implant, and we uh, people remember maybe Barney Clark, the first person to have an artificial heart implanted, and now we have uh, pumps for the right side of the heart, pumps for the left side of the heart that can be directly implanted into your body. Um, a lot of people know Dick Cheney, the former vice president. He's had a heart transplant now, but he was managed with a machine that was implanted that pumped his blood for him, and he was charged up with two batteries. Each one would last about 12 hours, and he would have to uh, shift from one battery pack to the next. And he would go around with a fly fishing vest on that had batteries in the pockets instead of fishing flies mm -hmm. and reels and such. And uh, he would, was able to go around. They've even had people that were fishing in boats uh, using the battery from the uh, trolling motor to charge their devices yeah. while they are able to go fishing despite the fact that they have such Weaker. Poor heart function, yeah. So it's a, it's an external heart pump that gets them by until they get their heart It's transplant. an internal pump. They, they put the pump inside of you, and it used to be the pump was quite big, big as my V8 fist here. Yeah. And then the pump got smaller, and they put it now above the diaphragm, and now the pump is not too much bigger than my thumb, and they can stick it right in the end of your heart, and then that bypasses the weakened heart, takes the blood out of the heart, but it bypasses that and puts it into the circulation so those people don't have a pulse. You know how you can mm -hmm. feel your wrist and right. feel the pulse? This is just a continuous 
So there's no tweeze, squeeze, it's just a continuous pump. A continuous pump. Yeah, a rather spendy experience. Oh yes, uh, very expensive. It's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but if that's your only alternative, uh, and then you need very close follow-up by somebody who has expertise in managing those issues. Right. Because you, the, the Lord gave you this uh, heart that you were born with, and it's a very complicated engineering machine. Mm -hmm. And for us, to, even with all the uh, experienced uh, researchers and so forth that have tried to develop all these therapies, there are, uh, Mother Nature is very clever. Yeah. Who, who would be candidates and who would not be candidates for that kind of a thing? Well, it's a whole lifestyle. I mean, you can imagine what it's like because a uh, recent blizzard that we had, if the power goes out, your batteries last for 12 hours and those people, the emergency medical people know where you live so that, and a lot of those people have to buy generators so that there's no way they can be without power. Right. When the very first pacemaker was developed at the University of Minnesota, uh, they used to plug in the pacers to the wall because they didn't have battery pacemakers like they have now. Yeah and they had a power failure, and seven children died. Yeah. And um, that was the impetus for developing the first pacemaker. You wouldn't want to put that in a person that has a prognosis, uh, if they had a normal heart, that has, that's poor. You wouldn't want to do it in a very old person. You wouldn't want to do it in a person with lung disease, or what, what would be the limits that you would? The, the deal is, is that is a very complicated discussion to have because there's so many things that go into the decision making. Dick Cheney was, uh, I'm assuming, I don't know, I'd have to look, but uh, he's probably in his 70s yeah. before he got a heart transplant. Now you could say the vice president had special connections yeah. and that kind of thing, but it's possible to do that. And he, uh, he was on not too long ago on, um, he was either Good Morning, uh, one of those Good Morning shows, where he was fly fishing with his daughter uh, on a river in Montana. Yeah. After a heart transplant. Yeah. And heart, then, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you about heart transplants. That's the next step. But finish your point about. Yeah. So the deal is, is that he. There are two uh, avenues that you can go through with these machines. One is what they call destination therapy, where they just put the pump in with the idea that you're never going to get a transplant because of your age and other circumstances. And then there's the bridge to transplant because finding your match is somewhat difficult and so you have the machine in that ties you over until a real uh, you know a real heart is available right okay so there's two strategies right um, let's take some questions okay a woman from Del Rapids asks does taking over the counter calcium cause heart problems no we get this question all the time your body needs calcium for your bones for your muscles to contract so having the right amount and uh, <laughs> I, I'm not a big believer of taking vitamins and supplements and all of these things that people try to do because living healthy is what makes you healthy, not taking pills from the store. The one exception, though, is vitamin D. And why is that? Because we're Yankees. We live up in the north where we're covered up with ear flappers and long sleeves <laughs> and all of that half of the year. And it's turning out this year, maybe three quarters of yeah. the year. <laughs> but the deal is, is that so making vitamin D, and then everybody's worried about skin cancer now, so we're all putting on the sunblock as well. Right. So you can go to the grocery store, get uh, orange juice fortified with vitamin D, milk fortified with vitamin D and such, and if you still don't have enough, then maybe you need to take some. Yeah, I'm taking 2,000 of vitamin D3 every day, 12 months of the year, and that's safe. The data says that you don't want to go higher than 5,000 a day. 2,000 a day, and if you live north of Omaha, you at least need to have that supplement six months of the year. Yeah, so that is the one exception. Uh, otherwise, unless I, there's something wrong with your body's absorption system, yep. you, you have a very clever system for getting what you need. Right, if you from eat the healthy. food. Yeah, right, from the food. From the food you eat. So yeah. not calcium supplement, vitamin D supplement. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm right. with you on that, too. I know there's some data about people taking calcium supplement and then increasing atherosclerosis and vascular problems as a result. So I wouldn't take supplement unless your doctor's directing it, and certainly vitamin or calcium levels need to be monitored if you are. Right, right. How do you determine what the correct dose of Coumadin or Warfarin is? Caller is a bypass patient and has had nine stents. So Coumadin is Warfarin. Now there are other options besides Warfarin. I'm a Warfarin fan. What's your comment about the blood thinners, the other options, Warfarin dosing, and that kind of thing. 
Warfarin dosing is like going to a shoe store and buying shoes. Only one pair is going to fit you. They got two million pairs, only one's going to fit you. So the warfarin dose that you might need might be different from everybody else right. in the room here. So that has to be tailored to you. Now what you need to understand is that your physician probably has 300 people that are taking Coumadin or one of the newer agents and they all have different uh, um, aspects. So the newer ones tend to be more expensive like everything in medicine and the, the price you're paying for is convenience and maybe a little bit of efficacy. It turns out that in the studies when they compared these drugs, only 65% of the people that were taking Coumadin were in the right range. And so the medicine, if you have too much, you can bleed. And if you don't get enough, you're going through all the motions not helping you. So you have to have a doctor that's fairly compulsive, and then you have to be compulsive about making sure right. that you're in the range where you're supposed to be. Right. My, my own personal uh, data, or my personal opinion, is that warfarin, which is even on the monitoring, is four times cheaper than the others. If the, It's the one most a dangerous group of drugs there is. I mean, people bleed to death from that medication, and, right. and, and you need it because you could clot to death without it. So it's the most important thing that you would monitor like a hawk. Right. And um, that's the only, and warfarin's the one I can monitor. I think one of the problems is, is that people just tend to give over their responsibility for their health to yeah. their doctor. Whereas the only person that's gonna bleed is you, and the only person gonna have a stroke is you. So I would say I would not trust anybody with that. I wouldn't give my doctor my credit card, so I sure in the heck am not going to trust them to. And, and I'm not trying to make some friction between people and their physicians, but you want to make sure that the person who called you knows you, that they have your interest in mind. They got the right Johnson, the right Smith, the right, you know, uh, miscommunication, I think, is the I cornerstone of most of the things that go wrong in medicine. If we all had our own personal physician or care provider, nurse practitioner, PA, and we had knew them, they knew you, the world would be a better place for everybody, I think. A woman from Sioux Falls wonders if the docs have any experience with krill oil. Yes, the, the deal is, is that krill oil is basically a fish oil. And the thing is, is you can get most of these things in a normal diet, once again. Um, the, the deal is is that there's only one fish oil that's regulated by the FDA. Most of the rest of them are not. And then you have to think anything that you're putting into your body, you have to be pretty sure that it's good for you. And where do they get the oil from the fish? Depending on where they get it, they tell you not to eat too many walleyes out of some rivers in Minnesota because they have mercury. mercury. And so where is the fatty part of the fish? They tell you to throw that away. And here we are taking the oils from the fish and putting it into your body. So you want to make sure that whatever you're taking is good. So fish oil, good. No problem there. You just want to make sure that the one you're taking is free of any other um, elements that you wouldn't want to be putting in. I like the idea of eating fish. And I also like the idea of a fish alternative, which is icosapentaenoic acid that comes from ground flaxseed, which also makes your bowels regular. Right, right. So I, in my lifetime, I've convinced or pushed a whole lot of ground flaxseed, you know, and if you buy it whole, it doesn't turn rancid. You grind it up the week you that you're use using it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, there's some cardiologists that are raising flaxseed. Flax we like that. Female from Yankton, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What is it? Please go way back to the basics. Also, what's the difference between an athletic heart and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? When an athlete falls over dead, is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or what else? That's a big, that's a lot of... <laughs> yeah, very quickly though, because yeah, we've got a, lots of oh, questions. Oh, sure, sure, Thank sure. Thank you very much. So an athlete, a conditioned athlete, the heart muscle will thicken yeah. and the heart will dilate. And if you're sitting in a dark room and I put two echoes up, one from an athlete and one from a person with evolving cardiomyopathy, they'll look the same. The deal is, is that knowing the clinical history is what distinguishes it. Now, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a different uh, breed of cat because that's where the heart thickens inappropriately without any stimulus to do that. Not because the person's working out, not because they um, uh, have high blood pressure, it's some other pathologic process and it's inherited in a very complicated set of genetics and uh, tons of research going on with that and people need to um, go with the cardiologist on that because even right. cardiologists have to subspecialize in that. Right. And, you know, it's that 
I think the, the fact that it gets so thick in the septum that it blocks the flow out the aortic valve. So it, it can do that. It. it can do that. Is that the cause? Is that why they have abnormal rhythms and die suddenly, or is it, uh, or have a tendency to die suddenly, or is it because of something else? The deal is, is that people that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there is a variety of myofibril disarray. And what I mean there is, normally your body's muscle proteins are lined up like this and theirs are askew like that. Yeah. And that causes scar tissue over time, just like a heart attack. And that could put you at risk for sudden death. Here we go. Athletes, sudden death playing, is there any, real quickly, is there anything that you as a physician or primary care provider or an examiner can do to prevent that? Mostly, I guess, family history. Family history, have you had anybody in the family that died suddenly with no explanation? Um, have you ever passed out unexplained? And then I better so, echo your heart. Right, right. All then right. you should have somebody look into it. Yeah. A man from Sioux Falls had two stents placed and is struggling with high blood pressure and low heart rate. Is there something he should be worried about? The deal is, is that the low heart rate, uh, Lance Armstrong, famous bike racer, won the Tour de France, resting heart rate 35. So it depends on your situation and what pills you're taking. I assume that after those stents, they commonly put on a beta blockers. blocker. Right. And it's designed to slow down the heart and lower the blood pressure. And protect it from abnormal rhythms. Exactly. So it makes it less work for the heart to do as it's recovering from having the stents put in. And I think a slow heart rate is okay as long as he's not passing out when he stands up quickly. Exactly. As long as that's not causing problems. Right. A woman from Brookings asked, what percentage of people with mitral valve prolapse will have a valve replacement or heart surgery when they're older. Also, what is going on when a person's heart seems to race and you can feel it race. So let's explain quickly what is mitral valve prolapse. So the mitral valve is on the left side of the heart. So this would be like my heart and my chest. This is the tricuspid valve. The mitral valve is the main valve on the left between the top chamber and the bottom chamber. And what happens is, and you can see by looking at this little model, these little cords hold your valve in place like parachute cords. So you can imagine what would happen if I cut one of the parachute cords, all the air would go leaking out the side of right. my parachute. So what happens in the valve is that the valve cord ruptures or the thing leaks back like having one cord that's too long for my parachute and then blood leaks back the wrong way. So that's mitral valve prolapse. Prolapse. So what happens then is, is that zillions of people have it very small percentages need to have their valve replaced to have it for years. But you think, think of the wear and tear, however old this, did Jay say how old no, they were? No, didn't say how old. However old they are, the valve is open and closed 100,000 times a day for however old she is. And you can imagine what your hands would look like if you clapped 100,000 times a day, even for 60 years. So there's wear and tear on the normal valves, mitral valve prolapse, those cords can rupture. And that usually is the modus for needing surgery, is that the valve is leaking so bad that the person is decompensating. Right, they're get dilating, getting heart failure. Right. And so when, it do, when that blood blows back, that enlarges those top chambers, and that's why the heart starts to race. You get atrial fib and arrhythmias because those electrical connections I talked about get stretched out. Get stretched so out. atrial fib generally needs blood thinners. So you need, if, if you're having racing heart, you need to get in and have it checked, have it uh, do a telemetry testing. What would you say, uh, one week uh, uh, or a one day or a two day? Um, the deal uh, is, is they have a variety of different monitors and it depends on how often you're having the rhythm. If you're having it all the time, they can put one on and find out in a day. But if you have it this week and then next week, then they have to be a little more clever about which monitor you need. All right. What are some causes as well as treatments of pulmonary hypertension? I'm loving these questions, people. This is great. Pulmonary hypertension, totally different story. What is pulmonary hypertension? Pulmonary being lung. Pulmon yeah, pulmonary, just like you said, is in the lungs. So the right side of the heart here takes the blue blood that got used from those blue veins in the back of your hand back to the lungs for another load of oxygen. The heart has to pump the blood through there. And if we took your lungs out and we spread them in the parking lot outside the building here, it would cover the surface area of a tennis court. So by the time you have higher blood pressure in your lungs, you have to have a fair amount of, of disease to have that happen. Half of a tennis court. Half of a tennis court. So the current pope is pope of 2.2 billion Catholics. He has one lung. 
Oh, shaking I didn't hands. know that. Yeah, he shaking had, um, hands, kissing the babies, giving big speeches at the Vatican, up and down the steps, one lung. Yeah, so he had, inherited that, or he had a cancer? He, uh, at age 13, I think he had tuberculosis. He was from South America, and you can imagine how many years ago that was. They didn't have all the therapies and things. And once his lung became compressed and, and uh, scarred down, there was no recovering from that. So the deal is, is that when you get high blood pressure, the heart is trying to pump blood through these little capillaries along the surface of a tennis court, and they've become damaged most commonly because you have problems on the left side. That's right. what causes the left-sided heart failure causes right-sided right heart failure. failure. Right. But many people have primary pulmonary hypertension, which is like a, an, uh, a destruction of the arteries that are feeding the lung. That disease has nothing to do pretty much with the heart. Uh, primarily, that's a primary disease of your lungs, and then the right heart, the heart is the uh, unfortunately innocent bystander that gets sucked right. up in the, in the milieu. So when you say pulmonary hypertension is one thing, when you say primary pulmonary hypertension, it's a, different it's a whole disease. different uh, bird, and, uh, and they treat it with uh, dilating drugs like Viagra, which right. is interesting. Right. A Yankton man has atrial fib, irregularly irregular rhythm and is wondering what are the side effects of the medications that treat this. So we've talked about the blood thinners, but there are other medicines that we use to treat atrial fib. What are they? Well, there's a, a great handful of drugs. Most common one probably is a blood thinner to be universal for everybody. And then two is a drug to slow down your heart because the vast majority of people that go into atrial fib, the heart will want to beat at an unacceptably fast rate. Yeah, 150. Normal heartbeat is about 72. So the deal is, is that they slow the heart down, and in some cases, we can shock your heart back into a normal a rhythm. Yeah, a normal rhythm. And so the, the, if you tell somebody you have atrial fib, that's like telling somebody you have a vehicle, but it doesn't tell them if it's a Prius or a cement mixer. Okay. So uh, everybody's uh, uh, atrial fib is a little bit different and unique. Yes. Now, all drugs have side effects. And what I would do for this fellow that, that wrote that question is the next time any of you that are in the audience go to uh, any peers that are your age, ask how many pills they take. In this country, you have to hunt around. I'm, I'm 62 today. I don't take any pills, nothing, zero. But I can tell you that if you ask 62 years old people as a rule, how many of them take no pills, there's not very many. No, it's pretty rare. And it gets worse as you get older. I would say, though, that, and it's important to say uh, that atrial fib can be due to a lot of many of a lot of causes, and that's the cement mixer versus the Prius. I would make point, the point, though, that one of the things that we didn't know when I was starting to practice, we kind of came to the last five or ten years, is to realize that sleep apnea is a real a significant, big, a big issue, significant with that. cause of atrial fib. What it, uh, explain that very quickly, and we'll go on. The, the deal is, is that the heart comes under duress because when your body doesn't get oxygen, when the airway closes, then you build up the bad gases, the pH of your body drops inappropriately, and then the blood pressure in the lungs go up, what we were just talking pulmonary about. Pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension, that causes the dilation of the right heart atrium. Chamber, and then you Atrial get fib. fib. Yeah, here you go. So, and you sleep a quarter of your life, so that has to be high quality because you can imagine a 30-year day being suboptimal how would your day go? You would feel terrible. Yeah. And that's why those people are miserable. Even if they wear the sleep machine, that, that's like uh, taking pills for something that you could fix primarily by just losing the weight. 80% yeah. of sleep apnea is weight related. N not, but not all of it. Sioux Falls woman asks, what are the effects of a leaky heart valve? Leaky heart valve, any, there, there are how many valves in the heart? And There's, The heart has four valves. When the valve leaks, the way I explained to it, I, I grew up on a dairy farm and they used to have a pump that would come up out of the well and you would go down to get the, we used to have to pump the water right. to, out of the cistern to get the water. Yeah. So if the seals aren't tight in the well casing, you gotta go like this because the water is always running back down the well when you're trying to fill your bucket. And that's basically what your heart does. So every time it makes a stroke, 100,000 times a day, you could imagine doing this in any leakage will Here's over time. Now the heart's able to compensate, surprisingly enough. Mild leakage usually you can get by with. But any significant, and once it gets to a certain threshold, then the heart starts to dilate. And once it does that, it can't recover. And then you need heart failure medicines and you maybe need valve, so surgery, valve surgery before you get to a point where the heart's so weak. That's right. A man from Yankton says, in yoga, 
I wonder what that country is. That was a joke. <laughs> and yoga, one thing they teach people with heart problems to do is relax and breathe. How can relaxation response benefit your heart? Oh, I, this I is love weird. that question. I love that question because we started out with stress at the beginning, is that when you're stressed out, heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, uh, cholesterol goes up, so relaxation is the most underutilized tool in the woodshed. The, the uh, comment that the person made about taking pills for AFib is it turns out just a healthy lifestyle and getting to your ideal body weight and exercising regular it turns out to do as much for atrial fib as all the pills that we give people. You know, we push too many pills, don't you think? Physicians push too many pills. Well, they, they do it as a consequence of our lifestyles, but if we adopted a little bit healthier lifestyle, the frequency with which people would show up with some of these dastardly problems would diminish considerably. It would be. Uh, from Facebook, if you have a um, serious arrhythmia, which is normal to you and frequent PVCs, uh, should you worry? So a person who is having a lot of premature ventricular contractions or P uh, PV VPBs or whatever you want to call them, um, if you have a sinus arrhythmia with PVCs, how dangerous is that? That's what it is, sinus, not serious. Right. So the deal is, is if I told you I will give you a one dollar bill for every heartbeat, today till tomorrow, a tenth of a million dollars, and the only thing you have to do to collect is clap your hands a hundred thousand times in a row, do you think you would collect my money? No. Not happening. <laughs> So it turns out that if you take healthy medical students, which we met about six before we came in for the show, is that two out of three, if we put a monitor on, will skip once in a while. So heart skipping is very common. A lot of people are distressed by that. Now, if it turns out that your heart skips more than 15% of the time, then it becomes, that starts to affect the efficiency. But it, right. here and there, a skip is nothing to be concerned about. Right. A man from Yankton says, oh, a Sioux Falls woman was diagnosed with a hole in her heart and is wondering what the implications going forward are for this condition. Hole in the heart. Now it could be between the two upper chambers or it could be between the two lower chambers or it could be elsewhere. Explain that. A lot of people don't know that we're born with a hole in our heart. Everybody is. And that hole persists into adulthood. The foramen ovale. Foramen ovale. And it's, it's designed uh, for you to be successful when you're in the womb. And that closes in the vast majority of people but not everybody. At birth at birth. A magic thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a, so, but the deal is, is if you do have a hole in the heart, you want to think of it like the valve leaking, because the heart is beating the blood, but it's not going into the right chamber. And so it's functionally like the heart leaking. The heart has to pump the extra blood that's going into the wrong plumbing, and then it can dilate and fail, and which can, in the way that a leaky valve does. We can fix it. And we can fix that vast majority of the time we can fix that without even having to do open heart surgery. We can fix it with a lot of our gizmos, I'll call them, that we can put in through a hole in you some place. Wow. Can you explain what a defibrillator is and what it does? Quickly, we've got sure, sure. wonderful question. A defibrillator is a, a thing like a pacemaker that is put into your heart and it'll shock your heart back into a regular rhythm if you have a catastrophic heart. Dangerous rhythm. Dangerous and rhythm. Dangerous and rhythm. people are doing that. Uh, are they putting it uh, almost always when the person has heart failure? Just if your heart ejection fraction is less than 30%, then you qualify to be considered for a heart failure because your risk of sudden death is high enough the to justify the expense and the risk yeah. of having the device. Pump. Or if you've had an event where you passed out, and we can prove that... that you know, if you have that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that's another situation that we would put them in for. Or, pa uh, or passing out from runs. they're generally for life-threatening arrhythmias. There we go. Um, a Sioux Falls man asks, what's the latest treatment for AFib? Also, what are your thoughts on a surgical procedure to surgically reduce the ventricular size of the heart? So anything new on atrial fib differently very quickly? Uh, they have ablation procedures that they can do now where they can use go, go through a hole and they rearrange the electrical components of the heart to make it much less likely. We don't have anything that we can fix everything, but the, uh, there are several people that have very difficult to manage rhythms, and then that can be corrected. Now, how about uh, reducing the, the ventricular size of the heart surgically, cutting this? The That's a very ticklish operation to do, and we generally ticklish don't right do that any uh, more. And you don't want to have your cardiologist be talking about ticklish procedures yeah. because that means the risk usually is up there. Yes. But the thing is, if you think about cutting into this chamber, you can see how big it is. Your heart usually has to be enlarged to take part of it out because if it's only this big and I make it smaller, then it's going to be very small. 
So those, and the thing is, we don't see people with huge hearts like that much anymore uh, from heart attacks anyway, because we intervene now. We used to not have all of these things to, to fix your heart before you have a massive heart attack. A woman from Mitchell would like us to explain the thoughts on a keto diet regarding to heart health. I'm not familiar with that diet. A keto diet? Do you, do you no, know I think of probably one that makes you keto acidotic. So, so it's a low carbohydrate diet, a protein, a oh, fat diet. Oh, I see. Diet. Okay, okay. So the deal is, is um, I tell people eat less and exercise more. <laughs> Pritikin, Atkins, South Beach, uh, all of these diets, we spent $40 billion a year on diet gimmicks and fads. And I tell people, if I gave you a pencil and I put some food on the buffet, you'd go over and you'd write down what you should do. We just don't do it. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, I think that's perfect, the calories that matters. We've got one minute left. We're running low. Gettysburg woman would like the docs to talk about Planet Heart. Very quickly. Oh, Planet Heart is a, a, a great... Uh, tool for you to go in because most people don't think that we're talking about them. I had a, in fact, just a, a this morning, I had a 43 year old fellow that works in information technology, which is a kind of a sedentary job. And um, he didn't smoke, had some family history, went in, found out that he has calcium in his arteries already at age 41. Now, he might not have come because he thinks that. That's old people disease, that older people get that. 100% mm -hmm. of the men in the United States have calcium in their arteries, but he had it at age 41. So it may it, change his life now. 10 second answer, PAD, wondering what can be done. Quickly, 10 seconds. Um, the walking, walk. You can increase your walking distance 120% if you're talking about blockages in the legs. Very good, thank you, Mike. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. It was a little tougher this week, fill in the blank. In 1628, who was the doctor who first described the circulation of heart, blood pushed from the right heart through the lung, back to the left heart, through the body, and back to the veins again? Mike? Leonardo da Vinci? William Harvey. Oh, William Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> Leonardo showed little things between the atrium, but it was William Harvey. Mm. It was Catherine Ford, Woodstock, Minnesota, who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Catherine, for participating. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. On call with the Prairie Doc is very important to a lot of people uh, in this area and in this region because it communicates a lot of very valuable information on health care, medical issues, uh, answer specific questions. The, this project takes dollars. We have people in studios and we have people that have to be paid and we have to do production costs even though Dr. Holmes' time, our time, the guest time is all donated. We still have production costs. We have a great foundation called the Healing Words Foundation that oversees this whole operation and is responsible for some of the fundraising to promote these programs. If you like this program and you enjoy the information you're getting and you find it's valuable, please feel free to go to our website and donate. We would really like to have some additional financial support and it's very simple to do and again it'll keep this program going for the foreseeable future. So the website is prairiedoc.org, O-R-G, prairiedoc.org. Go there, donate if you're so inclined and we thank you very much. Mrs. H was in her mid-80s when her husband died. I admired her as she provided loving care for him in sickness and in health, right up to the end. Despite his expected and comfortable demise, his death broke her heart. It was like the painting of Mother Mary with a stabbed and bleeding heart. Mrs. H began having trouble breathing, legs swelling, and profound weakness. I suspected what was wrong and ordered an echocardiogram. Science proves the heart is a powerful pump but history portrays it as the seat of emotion. As a pump, one heart moves about 2,000 gallons of blood each day and about three super tankers in a lifetime through 60,000 miles of arteries and capillaries and veins. The largest artery is the size of a garden hose, while the smallest capillary is the size of a human hair split 10 times. 
As a seat of emotion, the heart was described by Greek Aristotle 2,500 years ago as the center for intelligence, motion, and sensations, while the brain and the liver and lungs are there to cool down the heart. 700 years later, Roman Galen wrote, the heart is the organ related to the soul. 800 years after that, Persian Avicenna wrote, the heart is the root of nutrition, apprehension, breath, and the source of intelligence for all other organs. Others in medieval Europe claimed the heart gives rise to anger, passion, fear, sadness, or joy. We still romanticize that the heart has something to do with emotions. This is patterned in hearts by lovers during Valentine's Day, by H. Jackson Brown, Jr., when he said, sometimes the heart sees what is invisible to the eye, by Princess Diana, when she said, only do what your heart tells you, and by right-wing political pundits who critically term empathetic left-wingers as bleeding heart liberals. However, the emotional connection to the heart became more than romancing and metaphor when Japanese physicians described Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, or the broken heart syndrome, in 1990. A life-threatening and dilating heart weakness can follow severe loss, such as the death of a spouse or even devastating experience of a critical illness. Diagnosed by echocardiogram, the heart swells into the shape of a Japanese octopus fishing pot. Mrs. H's heart echo proved the diagnosis, and she was treated and relieved by diuretics. However, the ultimate cure came as she mended her own broken heart with new friends, positive thoughts, and some time to allow a cleansing grief flow over and past her. A big thank you to our guest, Dr. Mike Hibbard. Thank you, Mike, for joining us in our studio in the Jaeger Media Center on the campus of South Dakota State University. And another note, on April 28th from 9 to 12 at the Mother Butler Center in Rapid City, there will be a free spring empowerment conference by the Fully Alive South Dakota Organization. Pre-registration is required. For more information, go to Fully Alive South Dakota Facebook page. We didn't have time to get to all of our great questions for you, from you, for our, from our audience during our broadcast time. So if you'd like to hear the answers to those questions, please join us on our Facebook page as we continue now with Prairie Doc After Hours. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. A hip fracture is the most serious consequence of falling. It gets worse as we age. Over 90% of hip fracture patients are over 65. The broken hip, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota, and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, 
Dakota Allergy and Asthma, CoBank, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Black Hills Medical Society, 3rd District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison, and Flandreau, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swift Tell Communications. Thank you.